and thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's really my pleasure to discuss uh, sequencing VEGF and PD-1 inhibition in kidney cancer. And the disclaimer about being an immunologist, I'm glad about that. There's going to be quite a few slides on immunology so, or cancer immunotherapy, so please uh, bear with me. I couldn't help it. Um, I will start with very, you know, basic facts, which I'm sure are well known to this audience about um, kidney cancer. About two and a half to three percent of all cancers, which places kidney cancer among the ten most common cancers in men and women. The lifetime risk of developing kidney cancer is one in 63, a little bit more common in men, one in 48 or so than in women, which is one in 80. About 65 to 70,000 cases, new cases are diagnosed each year in the United States, and it's usually a, a cancer that appears in a more, in a later decade of life in the 60s. However, we are seeing also in younger patients in the 50s or 40s for sure. For Unclear reasons or partially clear reasons, the rate of discovery of new kidney cancers has increased a little bit after 1990s, and we think it's probably due to the fact that a lot of these cancers nowadays are diagnosed incidentally on CT scans, MRIs that are done for other reasons. Also, this has resulted in maybe diagnosing these cancers at a little bit earlier stage, so there has been a steady decrease in the size of the tumors at presentation, maybe because of these um, advanced imaging. About two-thirds of patients or so present with localized disease to the kidney. About 15, 16 percent, the disease may involve lymph nodes, and about 16 percent of patients present with what's called metastatic disease or disease beyond the kidney and the regional lymph nodes. You've heard about the different subtypes of kidney cancer. About two-thirds or so, or actually even 75 to 80 percent, are clear cell, renal cell cancers. And this is the way this name derives from the way they look under the microscope. It seems to actually influence the clinical behavior, so it is important for the pathologist to make a clear distinction of the type of kidney cancer. Clear cell, renal cell cancers are the ones that are most common, most studied, and for which we have the most information on what treatment works or do not work. So definitely, as the previous speaker has said, all the other more rare or less common types of kidney cancer, we are learning about them now, and the way we are learning is usually through clinical trials. Papillary cancers, chromophobe, you know, um, collecting duct, et cetera, all these other subtypes are a little bit less common than clear cell kidney cancers. You've also heard, and since I've been practicing, definitely I can attest to this, kidney cancer is not one disease. No two patients are the same. It's good to have an overall information, but always do not compare yourself to the next person. There has been the biological behavior is different. It has to do with Im the immune system, the interaction of the tumor with the immune system, the vascular system, the genetic makeup of the tumor, which is different between different patients. Sometimes it's different even, even from one tumor to another in the same patient. There are spectrums of you know, patients that have very slow progression, millimeters over years. You don't necessarily have to start treatment for a very long time. There are other patients in whom the cancer progresses faster over months. Most patients are probably somewhere in the middle. So you have to learn the patient, learn the pace of the disease, learn the characteristics, and that will influence when we start the treatment and what treatment we start. There are many things that come into consideration when we think about starting therapy for kidney cancer. The main ones for me are the patient factors. You know, the patient's age, the patient's functional status, all the other medical conditions, the wishes of initiating therapy, goals of care, the disease-related factors, prognostic scores, and we'll go over that uh, in a little bit because it's a set of criteria that helps doctors figure out when to start treatment, what treatment to start, tumor burden, the number and size of disease, um, other related factors such as the histological type, is it clear type, not, not clear uh, uh, cell carcinoma, 
and you know other factors such as genetic makeup to, of the tumor, pharmacogenomic factors, so more you know information that now we get from looking at the tumor makeup and sometimes you know the patients also germline um, genetic makeup. So the time of initiating treatment is different from different for different people. We usually agree that patients who have symptoms usually treatment is initiated fairly immediately. For asymptomatic patients, sometimes several factors are considered. Like I said, the rate of, pro of progression of disease, the number and sites of metastasis, the patient's overall functional status. Some patients may wish to delay initiation of therapy and the toxicity associated with this until we have more compelling evidence that the disease actually picks up the pace. So there is no one size that fits all with kidney cancer, and I think in general in oncology. Before 2005, we had little understanding of what the best treatments are for kidney cancer, very few treatments that were marginally effective, but we've learned a great deal in the last 15, 10, 15 years. It started with looking at the molecular mechanisms of kidney cancer progression, and actually, a lot was learned from a disease, a genetically inherited disease called von Hippel-Lindau disease, that patients inherit a gene that is mutated, and this gene has to do with the oxygen sensing mechanism. The, when this gene is abnormal, let me see if it doesn't show there, but when this gene is abnormal, it leads to overproduction of this vascular VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. It turns out that in kidney cancers in general, you don't have to have this disease. This gene seems to play a big role in the development of this tumor. So we've learned a lot from, from this model and drugs were actually developed based on this. So the main treatment of kidney cancer up until the immunotherapies came about revolved into developing drugs that block this VEGF, this vascular growth factor, either directly, bevacizumab, or a number of drugs that block the receptors or the sites where VEGF acts. This vascular growth factor basically promotes new blood vessel growth that promotes the cancer growth. It's abnormal blood vessels that promotes the cancer growth and spread. So if you're able to block this pathway, a lot of times you're able to control kidney cancer. So this is what we call targeted therapies and they are different from chemotherapies. Those are more smarter drugs in a way that act particularly on a pathway or a mechanism of, of development of cancer. Since 2005, we have had many agents that were approved blocking this VEGF pathway. Some of them, such as stem serolimus, um, there, um, and everolimus block a related pathway called mTOR but most of them block this VEGF pathway, and this has been the mainstay of kidney cancer treatment up until, I would say, a couple of years ago. December of 2013, we realized that actually novel cancer immunotherapies are making a great impact in the treatment of a lot of cancers, not only kidney cancer, but a lot of cancers. We've used immunotherapies, I would say, or people tried, researchers tried for about 100 years, but they were never quite successful. They had, you had to activate the entire immune system to be able to activate a small army, and that led to a lot of side effects and an efficacy that wasn't what, what we wanted. Around 2010 or so, new and smarter immunotherapy drugs were developed that activate, as I will show in a few minutes, the cells, the immune cells that are specifically targeted in our body to fight cancer. So the Science Magazine, which is probably our most prestigious medical magazine in 2013, said, you know, these new drugs will, are the breakthrough of the year, and I, you know, dare to say it's probably going to be the breakthrough of the decade, if not the century. Why is immunotherapy effective? Because our immune system evolutionary has developed to be able to recognize and attack cancer cells. And it does so effectively most of the time in our body. That's why we don't develop cancers every day and all the time. What do T cells or these specialized immune cells, immune lymphocytes called T lymphocytes, what do they need to fight the cancer? 
they need to be able to see the cancer, and they need to be able to be activated and to multiply. So they do that by positive signals in the body that activate these immune cells. However, it turns out that for each positive signal, we have a negative signal in our body that turns off the immune system. Why do we have negative signals? Because we have to be able to protect ourselves. If you've had pneumonia, if you've had influenza, and you have a big inflammation trying to kill that virus, when the virus is dead, you need to be able to turn off that inflammation. You need to be able to prevent too strong of an inflammation that will attack other organs. You need to be able to direct that to the pneumonia. You need to be able to maintain tolerance, at least immunological tolerance, if not other types of tolerance, to self. So the immune system needs to learn what are normal cells that we, won't want, that we don't want to attack. So for each positive signal, we have negative signal that turns off an immune cell. And it turns out that the cancers have figured this out as well. So they have adapted to hijack this exact mechanism of turning off the immune system. They have adapted to express on their surface a number of signals that fit into the, the negative signal of the immune cell to turn it off. It's like the key in the lock, someone some, you know, once said, and it's very precise. The tumor has developed a key that goes in the lock of the immune cell to turn it off. And I have a little cartoon here. So normally, our immune cells are able to recognize and kill the tumor cell. However, when the tumor blocks this interaction, they actually instead turn off and sometimes kill the immune cell. The most probably common and known now uh, pathway to do this is the PD1 or and PDL1 pathway. So PDL1 or B7H1 is the ligand to this program death one receptor that leads to the death of the immune cell when it's engaged. When this happens, the immune cell dies or becomes completely ineffective. This B7H1, actually, I'm proud to tell you that it was discovered at Mayo Clinic in 1998 by one of my dearest collaborators at Mayo Clinic Rochester, Dr. Hai Dong Dong. His, later, it was renamed PDL1 in 2000. And he actually first identified it from the normal human placenta. At delivery, it turns out that the, if you look on the PDL1 picture, it turns out that this lines the placenta between the mom and the fetus and forms a complete barrier that actually prevents the immune system of the mom to attack the fetus. So it's a normal mechanism, again, by which we protect ourselves. However, a year later, he discovered that a lot of the tumors express this as well, exactly like the placenta. They form a wall between the tumor and the immune system, and that's what, hap that's what helps the tumor evade the immune, our immune attack. So a lot of drugs have been developed nowadays that block, physically block either the PDL1 or the PD1, and blocking this interaction, the, immune, the tumor cell is no longer able to engage the immune, the immune cell and turn it off, and the immune cell is able to restore its activity and kill the tumor cell. So this is the mechanism by which a lot of these new immune drugs called immune checkpoints, because they act at that checkpoint, that is either turn off or on, these immune checkpoint inhibitors, they physically block the interaction between a negative receptor and the immune cell, and it's able to restore the activity of the immune system. Since 2009, actually, the clinical trials started, the very early clinical trials with these drugs. And again, going back to the discussion that we just had, if people would not go on and participate to those clinical trials, we would probably never know to this day that these drugs are so effective. They are now approved various drugs, either PD-1 inhibitors or PDL-1 inhibitors, or a related drug that I will speak about as CTLA-4 inhibitor. They are now approved in a variety of cancers from, as you see, their head and neck, melanoma, Merkel cell, liver cancer, lung cancer, um, lymphoma, kidney cancer, 
colon cancer, cervical cancers, etc. And it seems that an approval is coming probably every month for yet another cancer that we learn that these immunotherapies are effective. It doesn't depend as much of the cancer type because these tumors, these, these drugs act on the immune system, not on the cancer, as you will see. So I mentioned that it's probably going to be the breakthrough of the decade this year. The Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Jim Allison, who has discovered the first checkpoint co called CTLA-4, or cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4, and Dr. Tasuko Honjo from um, Tokyo University, who has discovered the PD-1 um, receptor on the T cells. This is Dr. Dong, our own Mayo researcher who discovered PDL1. His efforts, I think, are also, you know, not go not going unrecognized. Uh, he's a wonderful, uh, wonderful researcher, and he once, you know, told me when he met the first patient that had a complete response with one of these drugs. He said, you know, this validates my entire career. I was in the lab, and I'm in the lab from day to night, and I never know that if what I do makes, is meaningful for the life of our patients. And this is what keeps me going. And this is how science works. It starts with a discovery in a mouth, mouse 20 years ago, and slowly it progresses to clinical trials and then to treatments that make a big difference in the lives of our patients. As I mentioned, immunotherapy is the only treatment that doesn't work on the particular cancer cell doesn't depend on the mechanism. It works through our immune system, and the immune system is able to adapt to recognize and kill the cancer cell. All the other treatments, chemotherapy, targeted therapies, radiation, surgery, work directly on the cancer. What are other, some other differences between immunotherapy and targeted or chemotherapy? Chemotherapy and targeted therapy, it works as long as the drugs are in the system. You stop the drug, usually the cancer will grow back if that, that uh, treatment was effective in killing the tumors. We are learning that the immune therapies may work even after the treatment ends. Our immune system has memory. Once it has relearned how to recognize um, cancer cells and once these mechanisms have been, have been broken, a lot, a lot of times, the results of the immunotherapy last even after we discontinue therapy. We also learned that they, you know, we have prolonged clinical responses and sometimes durable or complete responses in previously incurable cancers. I have patients with melanoma and kidney cancer that have been now four or five, I think my longest one is actually started clinical trial in 2009, completely disease-free from stage four melanoma that in anyone's book would have been an incurable cancer because had tumors in the lung, in the liver, et cetera. So there we say the word cure for stage four cancer, I don't know, uh, probably so, you know, I think in the near future, at least for a subset of patients. I wanted to just briefly mention here the surgical options for stage four kidney cancer because kidney cancer is different from other tumors. We still do surgery, even though we're not able to remove the whole disease, we still do surgery, especially removing the kidney where the main tumor is. And all the evidence suggested that if we do so, we help patients do better long-term. So patients live longer especially in the era of previous treatments, interferon, so the older immunotherapy drugs, and especially in patients who were fit and had good performance scores and good prognostic features, as we will see. Is this still true in the era of targeted and immune therapies? It remains to be seen, and I'll touch upon a couple of studies um, that addressed this um, earlier this year. So the current I think questions in the mind of the oncologists and the patients is, what is the best first line? We have so many drugs. What do you recommend that I would start with, doc? What is the first agent that we start? And what is the sequence that we use these drugs in order to be able to maximize the benefit from each drug? And as I alluded to, do we still need to do these surgeries, remove a big kidney tumor that could potentially have 
side effects and a prolonged surgery and have a long recovery, do we still need to do that because we have all the smart and effective drugs? So I mentioned a few times the prognostic criteria. It's a set of clinical and laboratory criteria that the doctors use to, be, to try and see if we can predict by the combination of this criteria, the biological behavior of the kidney cancer in different patients. The main Karnofsky there is basically the medical language for the patient's fitness and physical uh, performance status, uh, time from initial diagnosis to treatment, and then hemoglobin, calcium, platelet count, neutrophil count, so number of laboratory criteria. Studies showed that um, depending on the combination of these prognostic factors, you can predict how long a patient will derive benefit from targeted therapies. The curve there in, in blue are the patients who have none of these this bad prognostic factors, and they actually have the longest response to treatment. Patients who have more of these factors may not derive as much benefit. So is this still true now in the era of immunotherapy? I think the landscape of kidney cancer treatment is changing significantly. In the past, you see there in the dark ages, we had very few treatments and you know, we were not able to provide such meaningful outcomes. I think we're now in that golden age where you know, half of our patients and we see a plateau with patients having long responses to treatment with kidney cancer becoming more and more of a chronic disease and hopefully soon, in the next few years, we'll get in the diamond age where we're going to be able with even smarter treatments to provide more and more cures to patients with advanced kidney cancer. So it's, even though not one drug, I think, can change the whole natural history and the course of the disease, we think that maybe the way we sequence this, we may be able to derive the most benefit from the treatment from each agent. We spoke about immunotherapies and about the different receptors and the two drugs, the anti-CTLA-4 drug called ipilimumab and anti-PD-1 drug. One of them is nivolumab. In melanoma, it was the first cancer where this whole immunotherapy or these newer agents were shown to be effective and also the cancer where we learned that if you combine the immunotherapies, you may get a better response than if you use each agent alone at a cost of increased toxicity, but the efficacy was also significantly better. So is this the case in kidney cancer? And who are the patients in whom we take that leap and we say, okay, we recommend the combination therapy even though it may have more side effects? Again, going back to clinical trials, all these questions are answered in clinical trials. This was a big phase three trial that randomized patients by the toss of a coin to either Sutant, which is the standard of care, one of the most, the oldest and the most effective targeted therapies, or the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. And what we saw is that, let's see if, um, what we saw is that in patients, um, in patients who are on immunotherapy, on that column with the green, on the ipilimumab and nivolumab, 42% of patients had tumor shrinkage compared with 27% of patients on Sutant. And you've heard before, 9% of patients had actually complete responses, meaning that we were not able to see the tumors on the scan. And interestingly, it was the patients with intermediate and poor risk, in other words, the patients with more aggressive disease that derived the most benefit from these immunotherapies. They also had, if you look on the panel on the orange curve, they also had more sustained and durable responses. 80% of patients on immunotherapy maintained the response a year or more. So again, going back to the mechanism of action and the durability of response on immunotherapy. <coughs> In addition, patients who express that PDL1 on their tumor, which we, it's a marker that we can look at, is not very, it's a finicky marker, not very reliable, but when you're able to measure it, it seems that it can give a little bit of information. Patients who express PDL1, if you look on the far column where it says PDL1 more than 
actually 58% of those patients had tumor shrinkage on immunotherapy compared to 22% of patients on Sutan. So more than double the responses that on um, targeted therapy. And again, this is for patients with more aggressive kidney cancer. So is it that for the first time maybe we are able to change a little bit the natural course of the disease and the progression of kidney cancer? Here, these curves show that the treatment, that the responses, this is with nivolumab alone, the responses are durable. They, late responses, even some patients that had to discontinue treatment because of side effects, continue to have tumor shrinkage, even in the absence of immunotherapy. And again, what we saw is also that the responses tend to occur early. It doesn't take six months for the immune system to get activated, as it was the case with the older drugs. Usually in 80% of patients we know by three months if the immunotherapy is gonna, is gonna provide a benefit. In some patients though, it's a, little, it's a little interesting, yet there is this phenomenon with immunotherapy called pseudoprogression, which is not something that we knew or we were used to when we use chemotherapy or targeted therapies. With those drugs, it either shrinks or it grows. So it either responds or doesn't. It turns out that with immunotherapy, the tumors sometimes can, the cancer can get worse before it gets better. So the tumors can enlarge a little bit before they respond. And this again goes back to how these drugs work. The immune cells are now all activated and are going to the site of the cancer and are all infiltrating the cancer. So sometimes on the scan, a tumor may appear that wasn't there before because it was just under the resolution of a scan and now you see it because it's full of immune cells. Or it appears a little bit bigger because again there is a lot of immune infiltration. So it's an art usually to interpret the scans. The radiologist will say growth of you know, tumors and progression of disease and it comes to the oncologist and you know, to the doctor that is used to treating patients with immunotherapy to figure out is this, can this be a pseudo progression? Is this enlargement meaningful? Do we have the ability to wait a little bit to see what is happening after that? This is one of my patients, one of the first patients that went on a clinical trial with, the, with pembrolizumab or Keytruda and melanoma in the country. And she had tumors by the kidney and in the lung. By the time of the first scan at three months, the tumors were bigger. And at that time, no one knew about the phenomenon of pseudoprogression. So the protocol said the cancer grows, she has to come off the study. And she said, no, I'm not coming off the study. I feel great and I know it's working. So I got on the phone with the company and I said, she doesn't wanna stop the drug. And they said, no, she has to because that's what the protocol is. And it was a very early protocol phase one study and we actually managed to keep her on the study. They said, okay, keep her on the study for two more doses, then we do another scan. If, she can, if the tumors continue to grow, she has to discontinue. And we did, four weeks later, we did a scan, and the tumors were shrinking compared to the week 12, and she was allowed to stay on the study. She's now disease-free. She's going on eight years disease-free. So we've learned, we are learning about a lot of the new drugs, and we are learning about this phenomenon, and it's always an art to, to see how much is the growth. If it's a lot of growth, a lot of times it's more than pseudoprogression. But if it's a little bit that fits into, and we're developing now criteria nowadays to look at what fits into the pseudoprogression, a lot of times your doctor may say, there is a little bit of growth, but let's wait and do another scan in a few weeks. And in some patients, the tumors will actually start to shrink and patients will have late responses. Going back to the trial that showed that the combination was better than suitant, this was actually not the case for the patients with favorable risk. So patients with slower disease progression did much better on suitant, if you see on that column there, 52% of those patients had tumor shrinkage compared to only 29% of patients on immunotherapy. So clearly one size doesn't fit all. Not everybody has to start with immunotherapy. Again, a lot of factors come into consideration. Nowadays, the way we look at the sequencing, we think 
For patients who have more aggressive disease, again, looking at those you know, factors, initiating combination immunotherapy makes sense because the evidence tell us they're likely to do better. For patients who have favorable risk, still targeted therapy with Sutant or Votriant or other drugs that we use in first line may actually be better upfront and may derive more benefit long term. I tell my patients, think about this as a marathon. It's not 100 meter sprint. We need to plan the treatment in such a way that we finish the race. So we have to think about what's best at what particular time for each patient. If patients are not, let's say, eligible to immunotherapy and they have more aggressive disease, we actually have evidence to suggest that even targeted therapies, especially a drug called cabozantinib, may actually be quite beneficial for this patient's first line. Some patients may have autoimmune disease, transplant, organ transplants, et cetera, and immunotherapy may actually be more dangerous. So this is the study uh, called Cabosan that looked at cabozantinib compared to sunitinib for patients with more aggressive disease with intermediate and poor risk factors, um, what's called, and it showed that more patients on cabozantinib, all the, bl all the blue lines that you see there represent patients that had tumor shrinkage on cabozantinib compared to the yellow line sunitinib. So this seems to be quite an effective drug in first line for these patients as well. And these patients maintain the response much longer than patients on sunitinib, and also the overall survival of the patients was better. So currently, the way we think about sequencing, again, either combination of immunotherapy or cabozantinib, especially for patients with more, more you know, rapidly progressive disease. And in second line, we switch a lot of times. So if you've had immunotherapy, then you know we use cabozantinib or one of the other targeted agents. If you have had cabozantinib, sometimes we switch to single agent nivolumab or immunotherapy. And this was the trial that first told us that immunotherapy is useful in kidney cancer. This was anti-PD-1, this nivolumab is an anti-PD-1 agent as monotherapy that was used in patients who've already had targeted treatments. And it showed that 25% of patients in that trial, even though they already, their disease was growing despite the target therapies, 25% of patients had tumor shrinkage and another 35, 34%, the tumor stabilized for a long time. So it was the first time when we learned that these immunotherapies actually can be quite effective in uh, patients with kidney cancer. And again, the responses were quite durable. And this just shows that it was better than the uh, drug called uh, Everolimus. You will hear later today from Dr. Tan about some of the side effects of this agents, targeted therapy, immunotherapy agents. Um, for immunotherapy, single agent anti-PD-1 drug, about 10 to 15% of patients may have side effects that are significant enough to require treatment, steroids, or treatment discontinuation. When you use combination immunotherapy, it can be slightly higher. With the doses that are used in kidney cancer, the side effects go to about 30%, so kind of double compared to single agent. But still, most of these, immune, most of these side effects are manageable and reversible. The side effects with immunotherapy basically result from too much immune activation. And those immune cells start attacking some of the normal cells, and the treatment is to cool down that inflammation. To uh, briefly touch upon the role of nephrectomy. So do we still have to do surgery when we have all these targeted therapies and immunotherapies? And this was a study that was made a plenary session at our national meeting in June, looking at patients having the kidney and the tumor removed up front, followed by sutant to treat the other sites of disease versus just sutant alone without surgery and it doesn't seem to make a difference if you have surgery or not, at least in patients with more rapid progressive disease and at least with targeted therapy. So the questions nowadays that are being asked in different clinical trials is whether this still applies to the more favorable risk patients, as we call them, the ones with slower disease growth, and to patients who are treated with immunotherapy. And should we do some immune treatment upfront 
get some shrinkage of the tumor, stabilize things, and then do surgery versus vice versa. Vice versa. So I think these are all important questions in the field that will give us even more information to be able to properly sequence everything that we have available from surgery to drugs to radiation for patients for treatment um, of uh, kidney cancer. What's next? Very briefly, I will touch upon uh, researchers are basically looking at combining the drugs. Now that we know they are useful, how about combining targeted agents or anti-VEGF therapy with immunotherapy? Um, actually, it seems to be quite synergistic, and there are a number of clinical trials combining immunotherapy with um, bevacizumab or with some of these um, targeted treatments such as um, axitinib um, or uh, uh, levantinib. And they seem to all have, if you see in the lower row where it says ORR, that's the objective response or tumor shrinkage, anywhere from 58 to 70 percent of patients had tumor shrinkage. But like everything in life, at a price. The more drugs you use in combination, the more toxicity you may get. So patients who have combination therapy may have a higher rate of possible side effects that may lead to treatment discontinuation. Single agent taxitinib, 5% of treatment discontinuation patients. Combination of immunotherapy, 22% of patients may at some point have to discontinue treatment because of side effects. So as the previous speaker has said before me now, I think the quest is to figure, to, to understand what is the best combination in, term of, in terms of efficacy and also safety and the lowest rate of side effects. In addition, there is a lot of effort in trying to understand how can we predict which patient will respond to what drug? Which patient does, who do we need to, to prescribe combination immunotherapy versus some patients respond just as well to one drug? And what is the best combination for a particular patient? So we've been involved quite a bit in trying to understand and collecting blood and trying to understand what are, are, the, are the best markers to predict that. And um, Dr. Dong has, um, and myself have published on this. This is, a, we're looking at a protein in the blood called BIM that actually seems to be, if you measure it before treatment and also during therapy, seems to help us understand who's better to receive the one drug, anti-PD-1 drug versus combination and how the treatment is progressing, including in those patients that I mentioned may have pseudo progression. So if you see the scan at 12 weeks, this particular patient had a new tumor in the spleen and the radiologist called this progression. The marker was actually going down and continued to go down and finally the patient was maintained on treatment. At 36 weeks, the scan was completely clean so this patient was actually responding. But if you don't have anything else to help you understand that you may be one of the patients who will respond, it's very hard to sometimes justify for the doctor and the patient continuation of a treatment when the scan shows new tumors, you know, why would I continue the same therapy? Maybe I should switch to something else. So having more information to help us make this clinical decision would be very helpful. We also have discovered that this PDL1 is actually shed from the tumor and it's circulating in the blood where it acts like an, a receptor that again turns off the immune cells in the blood, in the circulating blood. So we're looking at um, this marker and we also found that the level of this soluble PDL1 may predict which patients will develop toxicity to treatment. So a lot of things are being done. This is my last couple of slides. Some tum this is also um, an, an effort to try and make more tumors respond to immunotherapy. Some tumors are cold, and the immune, the immune cells can actually not, cannot penetrate in the tumor. So nowadays there is a big, and you probably will hear about this, there is a big effort to use viruses. We call them oncolytic viruses, which are viruses that only infect tumors. And they, in that process, they actually create a lot of inflammation in the tumor and the immune, the, those immune drugs are now much better able to activate that uh, tumor and kill the tumor. So we have a clinical trial um, at Mayo that combines a virus called stomatitis virus that's genetically engineered to just affect tumors, and we give that IV and in the tumor, and then we'll follow that with um, immune therapy. So 
I think with this, if I can move the slide. With this, I will end by saying that research is important. You know, clinical trials are important. You know, if we stay with the status quo, we're never gonna evolve. You know, an old pro proverb says, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, then all you'll, you'll ever get is all you've ever got. So I think we have great opportunity nowadays to really do more research and to really leap forward in the treatment of people with kidney cancer and other cancers. So it's great to work together, um, the medical, medical community with the patients and the patients, you know, advocacy groups to be able to, to do great things. So with this, I'll end and thank you for your attention.